get started. And we, there's a lot of information, uh, literature on the piano if you um, want to pick it up on your way out. Um, but we will get started. Um, my name is Rachel, and I want to welcome you to uh, the, a, a forum on health care forum. Um, we thank you all for coming tonight. Um, we're very aware that everyone has many commitments, uh, particularly at this time of year, and we appreciate your coming out to learn about health care reform and share your experiences. Um, I'll just give you a little background on who we are, the Westchester Health Care Reform Task Force. Uh, we've, it emerged after the 2008 election, and many of us were inspired by the activism of, of the election and began to believe that we had to start organizing around issues. And a, a group of us started organizing around health care reform in particular. And we, worked in, we were working along um, with a group in New York City that uh, Tim Foley was a part of, the NYC for Change. And we began organizing around health care reform. And it actually was almost a year ago that Tim uh, gave us our first educational forum. And it was in my house, and so it's quite appropriate that we're back to learn more about it. Um, so, and from those initial meetings in homes and, edu and, and educating ourselves, we expanded to, to larger forums and uh, <coughs> congressional leaders. But along the way, we've also realized that people have become incredibly confused about what is going on in the health care reform legislation or proposals. Um, and that people have also felt like their voices haven't necessarily been heard. Um, so we have decided to provide another forum for exactly that. Um, I want to begin also by thanking Reverend Allen for allowing us to uh, hold this forum in his beautiful sanctuary. I also want to thank Elizabeth Sanger for uh, all of her organizing work, um, Mariana bon Bonello, and Catherine Ryan as well for organizing the event, and um, Myra Saul and uh, Susan Van Dolsen for uh, publicizing the event. And before I uh, introduce our speakers for the evening, I want to uh, make an appeal for robust debate and uh, respectful civility as well. Um, in the past, we've been very happy to have you know, diverse views uh, articulated, and it's so important for us to be able to express our concerns and our questions. Um, but we need to do it with civility and respect. So I, with that, I will introduce our uh, panel here. Um, here we have Tim Foley, and he will um, be laying out some of the, the details of the legislation and answering those questions. Um, he is the communications director for the Committee of Interns and Residents, SCIU Healthcare, and editor of Universal Healthcare blog at change.org an organizer and policy coordinator for NYC for Change, a grassroots group. Um, many of us have followed his blog over the year, and we've learned a lot from him. We've learned, if we didn't know it already, that the policy process, the uh, congressional process, legislative process, is not, uh, is, is not is messy, and the outputs are not always ideal. Um, but we've also learned how important it is to have comprehensive reform, both for the country's economic vitality and individuals' and families' well-being. So we've learned a lot from him already. Um, we also have uh, Rabbi Daniel Zimbo with us tonight. And he is the spiritual leader of Community Synagogue of Rye, of Rye a 500-household congregation serving Rye, Rye Brook, Mamaroneck, Harrison, White Plains, Greenwich, and beyond. Um, he was ordained in 1998 from Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion in New York, and has served congregations in California and Massachusetts. He holds a Master's of Arts in Hebrew Letters and, is, and one in Jewish Education from Rhea Hirsch School of Jewish Education. Um, locally, he sits on the Board of Trustees of the Rye Youth Council and is a founding member of the Rye Clergy Association. And in addition, he's a board member of Kavod, a Sadaka Collective funding programs that help those in need live in dignity and honor. Um, Rabbi Groper grew up in Vancouver, Canada, with government-sponsored health care and is an ardent supporter of such programs. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Tim Williams to begin. The sound guy said that I was supposed to hold it like this, so if I'm too loud, someone just let me know. Um, first of all, thank you, Rachel, and thank you all for being here tonight. 
Um, it is always lovely to be up in Westchester, a uh, place I keep coming back to again and again to talk about this crazy thing we call healthcare reform. And the fact that Rachel mentioned that I was first here about a year ago speaks to an important point. We've been more or less working on healthcare reform, uh, if not as our top political topic, as in our top 10 for over a year now. It was over a year that Max Baucus's Senate Finance Committee first produced their blueprint for the legislation that they would ultimately follow. Some of that stayed up and some of that didn't. A year is a very long time to be talking about anything. And we've gone through many different cycles of healthcare reform, from just trying to get our arms around the way our healthcare system works now, which is confusing to a lot of people in and of itself, and therefore doubly confusing to try and figure out a way that reform would make it better or worse. We've gone through a period of time where there were emotional appeals on both sides, both for the morality of uh, living in a country where we somehow say that it is okay for 45 million Americans plus to live without insurance. For 40, uh, I think the new study is $44,000 a year for people to die because they had a condition but no insurance or ability to treat that condition. Um, and on the other side, of course, people were saying various things from this will literally kill your grandmother uh, to this will balloon the deficit to this will just about every name that you can you know, say in the book about it. This is socialism. This is something that is uh, against our culture, so on and so forth. So it's very hard to find the through line in all of this. To say nothing for the fact that pretty much for the past two months or more, we've been focused almost exclusively on Congress. Now, for many folks uh, don't follow Congress, there's a reason for that because it's very confusing and not all of those people are actually that likable. <laughs> With the net result that it seems less about a, a question of what we can do to have fairer health care, more equitable health care, better value for our health care, and health care that doesn't leave anyone behind, and more like a fight between two people who you don't really know and don't really like that much. Um, so we're left with a question at this point, almost a year after we've started, and at a point where the Senate is debating health care for literally the, uh, on the Senate floor for literally the first time in its history, of asking the essential question, why are we doing this again? And the simple answer is because we can't afford not to at least try. We know that people are very concerned about what life would be like after reform. But what that fails to address is what life would be like if there is no reform. That's a picture that we're actually pretty clear on because we've been dealing with it for decades now. It means that premiums continue going up at three times the rate of inflation. In an economy like this, that means more companies are double-checking, trying to figure out, can I even afford benefits? Can I ask my employees to pay more for their share of benefits? Or am I just going to be better off just, you know, getting rid of benefits altogether? We're living in an economy where small business, which is really the engine that fuels our job creation, is facing far more than 9% increases on their premiums most year. In some markets up to 12, 15%. There's no way that you can afford that. We're facing an individual market where no one really understands what covers what, what you pay out of pocket and what you pay for your premium where an insurance company is allowed to deny you care before, during, or after your contract precisely for reasons that you need that care. And we're facing a federal government where the single biggest driver of our costs, of the deficit, so on and so forth, is that we haven't found a way to start dealing with our rising health care costs. And there are obligations in Medicaid, in Medicaid, in SCHIP, so on and so forth that are rising just as fast as in uh, the private industry, but has the um, disadvantage of the fact that we're all paying for that. We know that there will be a system where there will be more people who are uninsured. It's gone up every year. In fact, it's gone up this year. When we say there are 45 to 46 million people living without insurance, that's really the last time anyone bothered to count. Since that time, we've hit with a massive economic recession and most people get their benefits through their jobs still, and many people have lost those jobs. We know that number's higher. We don't know how much. 
we know if we don't fix health care reform, the trend is that that number will continue to get larger. And who pays for the uninsured? We do. We pay for it in higher premiums, and we pay for it out of tax money that goes to safety net hospitals. Those same safety net hospitals, by the way, who are seeing their own funding threatened in states like New York and just about every state in the country because states are dealing with their own mounting deficits and need to start cutting somewhere. So we know that if we d don't do anything, our health care situation gets worse, the same as it has year after year after year. So why are we fixing this? Fundamentally because we can't afford not to. The plans that are in Congress are not perfect, and there are many things in them that cause me to groan and bang my head against the wall and say, for the love of God, Max Bacchus, couldn't you have made this a little bit easier? Um, but what they can do, but what they do is, number one, they set up a system that is paid for, that doesn't increase the deficit, and in fact helps to bring the deficit down. Number two, it provides common sense protections, particularly in the insurance market, um, for those who are really being preyed upon by their business practice. Number three, it puts coverage within reach for 29, 30, 31 million Americans who without it simply wouldn't have it. And when they go to the emergency room for care, because it's the only place to go, we're the ones who are paying the bill, those people would now have insurance and be able to make choices and be able to see the doctor and be able to care for their kids. It begins to reform Medicare, um, which uh, Medicare in general is a pretty great system, but it has some obvious flaws to it. The prescription drug program has some real issues for people in terms of affordability. There's a lot of waste in the system, a lot of money that goes to things that don't necessarily make us healthier and that we really don't need to be spending on. We'd be better spent with that money going elsewhere. Fundamentally, what it does is it gives us tools not to solve the problem at one blow. I don't think anyone can realistically promise that, although you will hear politicians saying that that's the case. But it gives us the tools to start to build on something so we can finally begin to put ourselves on a path of fiscal responsibility, on a path where we're protecting our citizens, and on a path where it's no longer the rule that if you don't have insurance because your boss doesn't offer it and you're stuck with a stroke of fortune, you can go sick, you can become more ill, or you can face tough choices um, about whether you can actually afford to get the treatment you need at the time that you need it. That's not nothing. That's something that's very important, and it would be one of the largest social leaps forward in this country's history. It doesn't sound like it because we focus on all the stuff that we may or may not get, but for the 500 pages of the bill that is in contention, there are 1,500 that would dramatically affect our health care as it is today. So I'm glad you're here. Ask lots of questions. Ask tough questions. We may not have the answers. We'll do our best to get them for you. But continue to stay engaged, because the only thing that's keeping us from a decent but flawed bill and a really bad bill is the public paying attention and reminding people who are in Congress, you know what, you work for us. And this is a problem to solve. And we sent you to Washington to solve big problems. Uh, so I also want to begin by thanking uh, Rachel for inviting me and, and being a part of this. Uh, I, I love that I'm here, a rabbi speaking in a church about healthcare. <laughs> it's also perfect that here we are about 10 days away from the, the first night of Hanukkah and there's lots of Christmas decorations. It's, it's actually, it's a very, I think it's very profound and there's a deeper meaning in this because it, it's a reminder that this issue that we're talking about tonight, it's not a Jewish issue. It's not a Christian issue. It's not a Muslim or a Hindu or a Buddhist or an agnostic or an atheist issue. It's a human issue. Healthcare is a human issue. Uh, as a rabbi, I speak through the prism of Jewish tradition and Jewish texts. So what I'm going to do is share with you uh, Judaism's view of the need to provide healthcare, not as a religious issue, but as a moral issue. And I invite you then to hear these texts that I'm sharing and translate them for yourself into the, the text and the teachings of your own religious tradition. Um, I want to do this because I think we need to come back to, as you said, the overarching questions of why are we doing this and not get so uh, muddled down, muddled in the, 
the details of what's going on. Uh, first, I want to tell a story, a personal story, that I, I see a couple of people here from my own congregation, so forgive me for that you've heard this story before. Uh, as Rachel mentioned, I grew up in Vancouver, British Columbia, with, dare I say it, socialized <laughs> health coverage. It's not really socialized, it's government-sponsored health insurance. And so when I was, uh, I grew up in a family that was, nobody was very handy in my family. In fact, in my grandparents' house, uh, when anything would break, my grandmother was wont to say to my grandfather, get a man. <laughs> and I wonder what that did for his own sense of self-esteem. But, uh, so I grew up in our, our in, in time, my, well, my neighbor, Peter Lambert, who, who grew up going to an Anglican church every Sunday morning, while well, his father had an entire shop room you know, filled with tools that, oh, I didn't know what they did, and they were all hung in their specific spot on the wall. We had a drawer that was filled with sort of some odds and ends of a hammer, a couple of, you know, maybe a wrench or two, a pair of pliers, a roll of electrical tape. Um, and so it would, it would come by then as no surprise that, that when I got into shop class for the first time in high school and got into wood, woodworking class, and the woodworking instructor teacher said to all of us when he was teaching us how to chisel with a piece of wood, don't hold the piece of wood with this hand and chisel against it with this. <laughs> well, I was really bound and determined to, uh, to have my initials carved in that piece of wood of whatever, I can't remember what we were making, but I wanted my initials there, so of course, I held the piece of wood with this hand, chiseled with the other, and I still have the scar to prove it. <laughs> so, being an eighth grader and thinking that I was uh, somewhat, you know, uh, invulnerable, I, I, I told him, I, when, he sh when I showed him what had happened, and he said, why don't you go to the office? I went to the office with a finger wrapped in paper towel, now turning the paper towel becoming quite red with blood. And the vice principal offered to drive me to my doctor's office, which was only two blocks away. I said, no, it's okay, I'll, I'll ride my bike. And so I got on my bike, rode to my, my pediatrician's office, um, walked in and he stitched up my finger. Um, I, I share this story with you because I never gave a second thought as to whether or not I had a doctor that I could go to. I never for a moment gave it a second thought as to whether or not I would have to pay anything to see that doctor to, to stitch up my finger. I never gave it a second thought as to whether or not that doctor would see me. And so I share all that because I think that no, so too nobody in this country should ever have to give it a second thought for to be able to see a doctor, for every child to say, I have my doctor, and to have that relationship. Jewish tradition <clears throat> imposes really a clear duty to try to heal, and this duty devolves upon both the physician and the society. Jewish sources on distributing and paying for health care are, however, understandably scarce and sparse, because before the 20th century, medical care was largely, largely ineffective and inexpensive. The classical sources that, that describe distribution of scarce resources and apportioning the financial burden for communal services deal instead with questions like providing for the needy or rescuing someone from captivity. Still, those discussions raise moral problems and suggest solutions that are often similar to those associated with scarcity and cost in modern medical care. One set of issues is this. Who should get what, who should get what when medical interventions are scarce and or expensive? And the other set of questions are, who should pay for health care? I want to share with you then a general sense of how Jewish tradition responds to these questions, which are at once so ancient and so contemporary. If particular forms of medical treatment are scarce or expensive, who should get them? In the Jewish High Holiday Liturgy, we say, who shall live and who shall die? And we say that answer is in God's hands. But with the benefit and responsibility of today's technology, we find ourselves all too often in the uncomfortable position of having the responsibility to decide that ourselves. And like the doctors who serve on the battlefield, we are left to do triage. The rabbinic passages that might give us some guidance about this form of triage go in four basic different directions. The first is the relationship of an other to you moving outward in concentric circles from yourself to the rest of humanity. The second would be a hierarchy of social needs, which basically says that saving people who are threatened by human attackers comes first, followed by things like providing food and clothing to prevent disease, followed by some order of curative health care, defense, education, culture, economic infrastructure, and the like. The third area of Jewish law that applied to triaging the distribution of health care would be a hierarchy of need of who, help, who needs help the most. And finally, a fourth strain in Jewish thought and law 
objects to any hierarchy. Instead, it emphasizes the equality of everyone, as each of us is created in the image of God. Now, although this guideline for the distribution of health care evokes warm, universalistic feelings and stems from deep theological roots and our common origins as the, crea as the creations of God, it suffers from the hard, pragmatic realities that prevent societies from giving all things to all people. These egalitarian principles, though, must have a call on the human beings who view all people as God's creatures made in God's image, and therefore teaches that what I want for myself, I should also want for my neighbor. Now the, now the question of cost. Who should pay for medical care? Jewish tradition divides that responsibility really among four groups, the physician, the individual, the family members, and the community. Normally, Jewish law permits physicians to charge a fee for their services. Indeed, the Talmud opines, quote, a physician who charges nothing is worth nothing. <laughs> At the same time, there is great concern that the poor should have access to medical services. The Talmud thus approvingly sets forth the example of Abba, the, ble the bleeder, who, quote, placed a box outside his office where his fees were to be deposited. Whoever had money put it in, but those who had none could come in without feeling embarrassed. When he saw a person who was in no position to pay, he would offer him some money, saying to him, go, strengthen yourself after the operation. There are similar examples among medieval Jewish physicians, and the ethic must have been quite powerful, because really it's not until the 19th century that a rabbi rules that the communal court should actually force phys physicians to give free services to the poor if they do not do so voluntarily. However, we know that today, not just the poor, but most people simply cannot pay for some of the new procedures, no matter how much money they have or could borrow. The size of the problem makes even conscientious and morally sensitive physicians think that any individual effort on their part to resolve the issue is useless. Moreover, the enormous costs of gaining a modern medical education must somehow be compensated for to say nothing of ongoing malpractice insurance, overhead for their offices and the hospitals in which they practice and staff and so on and so forth. So although physicians have some responsibility to care for others gratis or at reduced rates, they alone cannot be expected to bear the burden of financing health care. Individuals also bear some responsibility for paying for their own medical care. The basis of this, of this comes from the laws in Judaism of redeeming captives. The Torah teaches, if someone is taken captive and he has property but does not want to redeem himself, we redeem him with the money his property will bring against his will. Although this source speaks of redemption from captivity and not health care, the duty to redeem captives is based on the danger to their lives in captivity. And thus, this is a reasonable source for determining that an individual has a financial responsibility for his or her own health care. Moreover, one must pay for one's own health care before one pays for anyone else's for saving one's own life takes precedence over saving anyone else's. This obligation would then extend from the self to one's spouse, children, and relatives if they cannot care for themselves. The individual also has a duty to, con to contribute to the medical care of others besides one's family. Although this is never spelled out in just those words, ancient rabbis view the absence of health care as equivalent to shedding blood. Since the physician alone cannot be expected to bear the costs of health care for those who cannot afford it, this duty devolves upon the community and the costs of health care for the poor become part of the charity one must give. Thus, with donations from or taxes on its members, the community as a whole has the duty to pay for the health care of those who cannot afford it themselves. In medieval Spain, for example, Jews played a prominent role in the state's program of socialized medicine, while in other places, Jewish communities on their own hired surgeons, physicians, nurses, and midwives among their staff of salaried servants. Whatever the arrangement, the community as well as individual doctors were under the obligation to heal, and that was taken very seriously. In turn, then, the community must use its resources wisely, a demand that can serve as the moral basis within the Jewish tradition for some system of triage. The community must balance its commitments to afford health care with the provision of other services. The Talmud lists 10 such services. Quote, it has been taught a person should not reside in a city where the following ten things are not found. A court of justice, a charity fund, a synagogue, public baths, toilet facilities, a circumciser, a surgeon, a notary for writing official documents, a slaughterer, and a schoolmaster. At least four of these ten items are relevant to health care. And because no community's resources are limitless, 
and because social needs other than health care must also be met, the community must ensure that those who receive public assistance for health care deserve it. Thus, if a person repeatedly endangers his or her health through practices known to constitute major risks, such as smoking or drugs or alcohol abuse or overeating even for that matter, Jewish sources teaches that the community may decide to impose a limit on the public resources that such a person can call upon to finance the curative procedures she or he needs as a consequence of these unhealthful habits. One can infer also from Jewish teachings that the community has the right to assess the chances of success before deciding to expend the resources. For example, smokers cannot rightfully expect the community to pay for repeated lung transplants. Indeed, in light of the shortage of organs for transplant, the cost of the procedure and the bad prognosis for smokers and alcoholics to benefit significantly from such certain transplants, current medical practice denies them even one transplant. This policy is warranted from the standpoint of Jewish law. Individuals must take responsibility for the consequences of their behavior, especially after being duly warned. Of course, those who have no resources to pay for health care may accept public assistance to procure it. In fact, they must do so. For to refuse needed care is to endanger their lives, which is, for Jewish law, tantamount to committing suicide. Still, one code of Jewish law strongly condemns those who use public funds for their health care when they do not need to do so, and it appreciates those who postpone calling upon the public purse for as long as possible. Conversely, individual patients who have the money to afford something that the government or their private plan does not provide may decide to pay for the drug or procedure privately. This could seem unfair, but it is only the unfairness built into any capitalist system. Jewish sources do not require that Jews use socialism as their form of government or their rule for distributing and charging goods. So how then do we apply this tradition to contemporary America? Well, on the basis of most of these Jewish sources, the entire community is responsible to ensure that all its members receive the health care that they need. This does not mean that everyone should get every possible treatment, no matter how remote its possibility or benefit or how high its cost. The community has both the right and the duty to make considered decisions about how it will allocate its resources among its various responsibilities. Those who can benefit most from the procedure must come first, and then first come, first serve, regardless of social position, wealth, or relationships to the healthcare personnel involved. Jewish principles justify concern for the people of one's own nation first in such procedures as the supply of organs for transplant and of rare new drugs, unless, of course, international agreements can be reached to provide medical services, for example, to the citizens of any nation visiting another or in the organ transplant supply based on need, not nationality. It is only absent such agreements that concern for one's own care or one's own can le legitimately come first. The Jewish demand that everyone have access to health care does not necessarily mandate a particular form of delivery. Any delivery system that provides basic needs will meet these Jewish standards. Thus, while President Obama's original proposal for government-sponsored health insurance for those who cannot obtain or afford private insurance would surely fit Jewish criteria for meeting communal responsibility, so too would any other mechanism that provides basic minimum health care to everyone. The fact, however, that more than 46 or 47 or however many million Americans now truly have no health insurance is from a Jewish point of view, and I would, I would probably guess and add from any religious point of view, an intolerable dereliction of society's moral duty. The Torah, the prophets, the rabbis of Jewish tradition all loudly proclaim that God commands us to take care of the poor, the starving, and the sick. Given the current cost of health care, almost all of us then fall into that category. That is why Jewish tradition calls upon us to reform our health care system, not to make the perfect the enemy of the good, but to cure the system and to provide healing for those who need it now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've had two superb speakers, as you hear, and we as as we've said, we're very anxious for a robust uh, debate and real information. So we've handed out index cards. If you like to write questions on the cards, or if you have a question just to raise your hand now, I will repeat it so that it's clear on the microphone. And uh, our, guest, our honored guest can address it. Would you raise your hand? Yes.
That's it. Yes. Um, I'd like to know, I, I, I think that the, the reforms that are presented or suggested are neither revolutionary nor are they going to fix the problem. I would like to know what you think there is in the legislation proposed that's actually going to address the cost issue and the rising cost issue, because I don't see anything there. Okay, addressing the cost issue, that's the critical thing, and a lot of people are talking about that. Thank you. Absolutely. I'm happy to have you jump on that. There is a limited extent. Well, let me put it this way. There, um, the White House obviously is pushing this article from Ron Brownstein, um, that in which MIT economist Jonathan Gruber is wildly enthusiastic about the Senate health care bill and says, I can't think of a cost control measure that they have not put into the bill. Obviously, there's kind of a big one that they're missing, which is, of course, the billions of dollars that private insurance companies spend on administrative waste. However, um, one of the things that I would say as a starting point is let's define our terms of cost. There is cost in the system as a whole, which as we know is $2.4 trillion and rising. There is cost to the federal government in terms of how much it is spending on health care. And then there's cost to the individual person, not just in premiums, but also in co-pays and deductibles and what you're going to pay out of pocket. I would rate the legislation that we're looking before in the House as doing the most with how much people are paying out of pocket. Because the reason being is that currently that number could be infinite, meaning that there is no hard cap on copays, on deductibles, so on and so forth for catastrophic coverage. If you don't have health insurance, there's absolutely no cap. In addition to that, even if you have health insurance, you might have something called a lifetime maximum benefit, where after two to five million dollars worth of health care, the insurance company says, you've been a great customer, you are now on your own. The House bill contains caps on, hmm, I'm very sorry this is popping everybody. The House bill contains caps of $5,000 for an individual and 10, uh, not, Yes, $10,000 for a family of four on out-of-pocket spending per year for everybody, those who are in the exchange and those who are out of the exchange. It also eliminates co-pays on preventative care. This is important because, obviously, our healthcare system, by any objective measure, doesn't do enough with preventative care. And the areas that we actually legitimately are better than most other countries, most other countries kind of have us beat on a lot of health indicators. Um, but a couple of the ones where we're shining stars tend to be ones where we aggressively screen with preventative care, things like colon cancer and so on and so forth. So in terms of cost um, that you're paying in addition to your premiums, the plans do pretty well. Not great, but pretty well. In terms of cost on premiums, the Congressional Budget Office released a report just yesterday looking at the following people. People who have employer-sponsored insurance right now, people who uh, have employer-sponsored insurance through a small business, and people who, don't ha who have insurance on the individual market. And they were basically asked, did their premiums go up or did their premiums go down? They stay the same or go down slightly for those empl with employer-sponsored insurance. The Congressional Budget Office is nonpartisan. It's neither Republican nor Democrat. It's a bunch of math nerds in a room. Um, and they estimate 0 to 2 percent, uh, negative 2 percent. For the small business, they say it's somewhere between plus 1 to negative 3 percent. For an individual, um, there will be some individuals who have very catastrophic care right now, which means it doesn't cover all that much. They're going to see their premiums go up, but they're not going to go up as much as their insurance will actually dramatically improve. Um, if you're only getting catastrophic care, you're covered for what I like to call Mack truck incidents. You get hit by a Mack truck, you're covered. You didn't get, didn't get hit by a Mack truck and something less than that, mm, probably not. So they'll have robust insurance, but they'll be paying significantly less. More to the point, people who are buying through the health exchange, this national marketplace where you can compare like to like for comprehensive plans if you don't have insurance through your job, 
will be seeing their premiums from what they could expect to get for that same plane on the individual market go down by as much as 56% because they'll be getting a subsidy for it. So in terms of premiums, generally they're either going to stay the same or go slightly down. But then the larger question is our healthcare expenditures in total. And the biggest thing that the federal government could do other than, you know, outlawing private insurance, which it seems clear that unless they have a massive comprehensive change of heart of 100 senators tomorrow, it's not in the cards this time around. Um, and there will be future times. Um, the main thing that they can do is they can affect Medicare. They can affect Medicare and they can affect Medicaid and the spending on that. And do they do that? Well, sure, because I have Republicans uh, on the floor of the Senate right now denouncing how Medicare is going to be cut and how dare we cut from Medicare and so on and so forth, um, ignoring the fact that one of the things that we need to do is not cut Medicare as in the benefits, but bring the spending under control. There are a number of different mechanisms that can do that, and I can probably answer that at greater length. But if you're going up and down the line, Part of um, the rhetoric on why we shouldn't have health care reform is uh, sort of directly contradicts the notion that there's no cost containment in this proposal. Um, because they're complaining about it, that uh, the money that will be going into the health care system is less. Now, it's not enough. More still needs to be done. The single biggest waste in our health care system is actually uh, out of that $2.4 trillion per year, $700 billion goes on what the Dartmouth Atlas College study says is treatments that don't make us healthier because they're duplicate tests or there's the paperwork got missed, messed up or you're paying for something much more expensive when a cheaper treatment would do just as well. That, when I say we're building the tools for the future, we really need tools because it's not like that waste is, uh, you know, just to go with a, a Thanksgiving analogy, it's not like there's like a river of fat just on the one side of the turkey that you can lump off. It's marbled all the way through the texture of the meat. Um, things like the Independent Medicare Advisory Committee, which would have rights to reform Medicare further. Things like the Medicare Innovation Project, which is in the Senate bill and empowers the HHS director to actually act on some of these ideas for saving money that we've seen in the future. All of that is expected to have a dramatic effect over 10 and over 20, over 30 years on how much we're spending. It's not doing it all at once, but uh, like I said, there is strong hope that uh, we've created some tools to start tackling the problem. Thank you. Uh, I beg your pardon? I have. I have. Let me repeat because it may not get The question was Have you actually read the bill? That's. I've read H.R. 3200, which was the original House bill. I have read half of the Senate Health, uh, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee bill that came out in June. I decided to wait on the other half till Senate Finance came out. I read all of the Senate Finance Committee bill, which is actually, I would recommend if you're going to start with one, start with that one, because they actually write it in regular English instead of legislative language. And then I read uh, H.R. 3962, which is the full House bill, the 1900 pager. I have not gotten through the full Senate bill yet. I am about 200 pages in, and I'm waiting for a long weekend. <laughs> yeah, no, wait, excuse me. Let, try to raise your hands. I have some questions on cards, and I see a hand in the back. I'll take and that I'll, one I'll next. I'll go through if you have questions on cards. Please yes. There more cards. Please. I don't know. As a small business, as a person that buys insurance for a small business, uh, we saw an increase. This bill is not going to go into effect until 2015. And by the time it gets into effect, at, at, at that increase, uh, by the way, we have to increase our coverage. Okay. Um, one to three percent um, cost reduction means nothing. Um, because it's been going, it's going to be going up at 20 and 15, whatever it is. So by the time it gets into 50% or better. Mm -hmm. And then the other part is, um, as if you have a business, if you get your business, your insurance to your business, um, you're not going to be able to participate. That's the second part. In, in, the, uh, in the marketplace, or if there is a public option, mm -hmm. uh, you won't be able to get that. Um, I think those two options have taken and completely and eliminated any benefits. Of the health in the short run, of any health 
very, very, very important question about the effects on small business and the expense of providing health care and the lag time in terms of when the when any legislation can actually come into effect and how how that will help small business survive and offer health insurance. Well, I want to say thank you because you actually brought up something that I forgot to mention when I was going through the CBO report. The one thing that they specifically say is that in calculating that negative one that one plus one to negative three percent, which you're right, is nothing compared to the the visor that you're really stuck between uh, right now with your premiums going up every year, mm -hmm. they're not taking into account the tax credits which would allow small businesses to purchase insurance either on or off the exchange. So that is where the savings comes through. One, as a small business owner, you would have the option of saying that I'm going to purchase one of these plans on the exchange, which would come with some type of a subsidy for your employees who qualify. Um, but you're right with the larger problem. The House bill doesn't set up the exchange until 2013. The Senate bill doesn't set up its exchange until 2014. Um, it's really hard to explain why that, that, that is because there's obviously a fair amount of politics involved. Why? Because presidential elections in 2012, okay? Obviously, they don't want to be setting up a health exchange, um, if, especially if it's bumpy, for political reasons during that time. There are plenty of benefits that begin in 2010. And more to the point, there are a couple of things that need to happen before we can have a health exchange. The single biggest one is primary care physicians. Primary care physicians uh, are, is currently on a pace where if we do nothing, we're gonna be about uh, 85,000 primary care physicians in short in this country by 2016. <laughs> That was a report that I just read from MedPAC yesterday. Um, that's a big problem. Why? Because we want people to go to primary care physicians. We want them to get treated for their illnesses when they're relatively cheap, relatively early, so on and so forth. That helps bring the cost of our healthcare system down because we're not paying for expensive interventions later on down the road. Starting in 2010 is when the provisions to try and attract more people into primary care go into effect, including a loan repayment program. Most people don't realize this, but when physicians graduate from medical school in this country, they could have anywhere from $150,000 to $200,000 worth of debt. And then they have to go through residency, at which point they're being paid maybe fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year for a couple of years. And then they start making the money, only if it's primary care, it's really not the money because it's really expensive. We need more primary care physicians. It's going to take a couple of years ramp up time in order to do that. The second thing that's worth mentioning is a lot of people live through the transition from Medicare Part D. Uh, a lot of people, it confused the bejeebers out of them, the way that they set up Medicare Part D. So what they're trying to do is no, they know that they can't get an exchange open in year one without it being a really rocky system that's a bad experience for most people. They need a couple of years. And then they edged a little bit further into 2013 and 2014, which is probably too far, I would readily admit. Um, the other things that happen right away in 2013, and I think they're, oh, we've got the handout of that? Rachel's got the handout of that, so you don't need me to read it out loud. There are, um, the, the one thing that I'll say is that it really starts working on Medicare in year one. Uh, a lot of the reforms for Medicare, including, including closing up the donut hole, removing co-pays for preventative care, so on and so forth. Some of that happens right away. Rescissions, the, um, the practice of canceling your policy. Um, at a time when you get sick based on a discrepancy in your paperwork would be outlawed in year one. There's, there are some, as much as they feel that they could reasonably get started, they got started in year one. It is a lot to wait, but if the alternative is that it never gets fixed, that's not, that's really not an alternative. Did you want to add something? I just, what I want to add is almost from a moral perspective, and first of all, I, I want, like, uh, as much as it, it sometimes feels like cold comfort, I want to say I share your pain. No, and I, that, that being a small business owner. I mean, I understand being, being a rabbi in a synagogue, 500 households, the synagogue is sort of like a small business. And, and you know, even, even not, you know, not for profits and religious institutions are, are, you know, face hefty increases in terms of health coverage and things like that for its employees. Um, I think we have to be 
careful to say, and we have to look at, we, I think like what you've done broke, by breaking this down is so helpful because I think we have to look at these things and say, well, what are, while we might not get everything, what do we get? How do we avoid, how do we stop looking for something that's perfect um, or a magic bullet, but look for something that's good and remember how long this has been going on in this country, how long we've been struggling and striving and, and, and working to reform this system in some way and it's always fallen, it's not only that it's fallen short, it's just fallen flat. And I think the importance is to say, okay, the, the value, the moral value here is about reforming healthcare. It's about finding ways for those 46 or 50 million Americans. And that's incredible, and now it's, more, it's like 15% of our population that walks around without anything. Um, the, that, that to be able to bring those people and get them covered, I think that will ultimately benefit everybody. Because if you have uninsured people, remember using the using the, the emergency room as essentially their only place for health care, it ramps up the cost for everyone else. If if you have um, tens of thousands of people in this country dying every year because they don't have any kind of health coverage, uh, f to me, from a religious perspective, that's immoral. Um, that this nation that is all about you know freedom and, and opportunity and doesn't provide for that and doesn't allow for that is something we have to work on. So I think we have to be careful that we don't, again, make the perfect the enemy of the good and that something is the first sort of, is, I would say the first step. I don't think it's going to be the last step. I don't think whatever gets passed will be the end of healthcare reform, but it's the beginning of, uh, of a long road that we're going to be in, that, in for, for a long time. Um, there's a, a book exactly interesting that Nicole and I are both reading that I just, I want to recommend to all of you. Uh, it's, you do yes, have it for sale? Don't. We don't have it for sale, but just happened that, that, that we both came with it. It's called The Healing of America by T.R. Reid. Uh, they have it at Arcade and Rye? Okay. Um, R -E -I -D. Also available, T.R. Reid um, did a documentary which is right. available on Frontline on your computers on the internet. You go to the Frontline website and look for um, uh, healthcare, I believe it's healthcare okay. around the world. Yeah. Sick, so, excuse me, yeah. sick around the world, but it is also, it is what T.R. Reid developed and researched as he was writing this book, is now available for free from Frontline website. Right. He's a correspondent and, and a, um, uh, for the Washington Post. And basically, essentially the book is, is that he went, hit a shoulder problem, he went around the world trying to see w how they would fix it and, and compares all these different countries. The point is this, is that other countries' healthcare systems are different than ours, and some people might say they're better than ours, but they're certainly not perfect. Um, and they're always trying to fix them. And they're trying them. to fix That's them. What he says. They're trying to fix them too. But when we have, you know, 15 to 17 percent of our GDP is is is, is spent on healthcare, and other countries like Canada spends 8 percent, you want to say how can we how can we how can we adjust this? Because I think the ultimate benefit is for the rest of this for the whole country. Um, and as a rabbi, I tend to look at things from a global universalist kind of perspective to say, you know, it's not just about what I get, but what can we get? What kind of society, what kind of, what, you know, what kind of country do we want to build and do we want to live in? And I might say about the T.R. Reid book, it's just a very engaging, enjoyable, delightful read. R.E.A.D. by the writer, R.E.I.D. Uh, I have another few more questions. Did you want to add something? I, I'm sorry. Just very quickly, one of the big lessons from that book is that other countries even the ones who really like their healthcare system, like France, loves their healthcare system. They change it all the time. The, every couple of years, there's another healthcare reform to tinker with this or tinker with that, so on and so forth. And the irony is that in, you know, in study after study, we don't really like our healthcare system, but we don't want to change it. Uh, and that's really one of the key lessons from around the world. It's not that one system is better than another, but that no matter what system you have, it's about changing it and adapting and so on and so forth. And other countries are, are frankly, much more experimentative in that um, to their betterment. Uh, we have a lot of written questions. This one refers to the uh, blanket, blanket antitrust exemption, the famous way that uh, health insurance and baseball are alike. <laughs> uh, is, the, is the exemption going to be removed and what will be the impact? Are people familiar with this issue? Yeah. yeah, so basically there are only two businesses that are exempt from uh, the antitrust uh, laws uh, at the federal level. Major League Baseball, 
um, and the insurance industry for both health insurance and medical malpractice insurance. Well, what does that mean? Um, in most industries, it would probably be a bad thing if all of the competitors in a certain district called each other up and said, these are the prices that I'm going to do this year. Do you think you guys could be in the general vicinity of mine? It would also generally be bad for uh, most competitive um, industries if all the competitors said, look, we're both really big. I don't want to fight you. Why don't I take New York? You take Philadelphia. With an antitrust exemption, that's actually totally fine in the insurance industry and happens all the time, which is why a report by the American Medical Association uh, found that 94% of the insurance markets in this country are deemed non-competitive. The standard for that is that one or two countries, uh, countries, good, hello, one or two companies have a majority of the customers. In some states, like for example, Maine, or North Dakota, it's one. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Dakota has nearly 75% of the customers. Um, we don't exactly know what effect that has, but it's probably not a good one, something that we generally wouldn't put up with with other industries. Uh, and we also, would, if I can just throw one more thing in there, is the other thing is that we do know that premiums are on the rise. Um, and they're on the rise in part because there's not enough competitive pressure. Uh, people aren't searching around for the best values when there's only one game in town. Will it survive? It's in the House bill. It's currently not in the Senate bill. One senator, at least, is planning to offer it as an amendment. Does it make it into the final bill or not? Stay tuned. <laughs> okay, we have some. Yeah, that, that's, really, excuse me, we need to get the questions on the line. If I can just say that, just very quickly, that is something in the bill. Um, states would be allowed to have compacts with other states, meaning that New York could say, let's go to Minnesota, and if both the New York and the state and Minnesota agree, you can buy across state lines that way. It's the difference between opening it up to everybody, at which point every insurance company in the world would move to Idaho, um, and opening it up to states who say, you know, we've got relatively comparable packages, and but it might be good to get some competition in here. I have more, lots more questions here on cards. This is an interesting one. Nurse practitioners, as a group of provide, are a group of providers that are currently providing primary care and are available to provide that care right now. How do nurse practitioners fit into the current healthcare reform bills? I'm sorry guys, it's me again. Um, I love nurse practitioners. One of my best friends is a nurse practitioner. This bill doesn't do, one, neither one of the bills do enough for nurse practitioners. Basically what they are um, is that they're a nurse who's gone through some advanced training, which in some cases would enable them to do a lot of primary care functions, similar to a physician, uh, as well as preventative care. Uh, they get, tend to get used an awful lot in community health clinics, which both of these bills do support with additional money and additional expansion. Um, it is something that I wish was heavier in the bill, and it's something that I think we can push for even after this bill is done. Um, because the real problem with nurse practitioners is not so much, uh, this, it's not a similar problem with doctors. The biggest problem with nurse practitioners is that the trainers for nurses and nurse practitioners don't get paid enough. It makes more financial sense to stay a nurse than to go and be an instructor at a nursing school. Uh, it's one of the ideas that was on the table. I have not seen it in the final bill, and it's something that we need to keep pushing for because they, you know, they help our system. They help keep our system cost effective, and generally, they get very high marks for uh, their touch with patients. Here's another question that we have sort of touched on, but not entirely. As a healthcare provider, this person says, Medicare works, but the reimbursement continues to decrease each year. If it continues, I'll be out of business. <coughs> yeah, it's obvious. Uh, um, HMOs are no better. Their fee schedules, fee schedule continues to decrease and copay increase. We all have experienced some of that. Is there a question on the back? There's a question on the back. It's a separate question. So I'll take oh, that okay. one and then I'll... Um, Medicare... No, actually, it's, about, it's more about from the small business point of view. 
as an employer, premiums continue to, to rise, so I have to, I've had to also increase employees. We've talked about that a little bit, employee deductibles. Um, one of the things that the bill really tackles is Medicare reimbursement rates for primary care. Does it tackle it enough? Probably not. Um, but primary care rates are, generally speaking, too low in Medicare. Um, there is a bonus structure in both the House and the Senate version where to help get those rates up. Um, as a quick side digression, Medicaid rates for primary care tend to be even worse. They tend even to be about 20 to 30 percent lower than Medicare. Uh, one of the, the House bills, uh, or the House bill would actually increase Medicaid primary care reimbursement rates, so it's at least as good <coughs> as Medicare by 2012. That's again one of those things that starts happening right away. Um, but the other thing that uh, Medicare is going to be primed to do is they're running a lot of these pilot projects, and a lot of them are really focused on delivering better care. A lot of our system, because it's fee for service, is focused on doing more care rather than doing better care. We know that there are other models for doing this. Why? Because people are using them. In Northern, in North Carolina, all of their Medicaid patients, or a huge chunk of them, run on something called the medical home, uh, which emphasizes, emphasizes primary care and having one central doctor who's sort of in charge of coordinating your care no matter which specialist you see. They also use that in San Francisco, in the healthy San Francisco universal healthcare system there, and it's similar to the coordinated care they've done in the VA. We're not really doing it in Medicare. We've had a couple of test projects, but they haven't really been substantial. This would start to really invest in the, the medical home. One of the main beneficiaries of that would be primary care and people who focus on coordinated care. I'll start. Um, there are a couple of, so basically, we have this, just to give people context, because I think a lot of people are unclear on who would be eligible for it or not. There is this thing called the health exchange. It's a big marketplace where you can compare like to like. Um, it's set up by the government, similar to the way that they provide benefits to federal employees. Everyone from a member of Congress to the postal worker has choices. They have choices that actually I don't have, and I'm sure many of you don't have, unless you're a federal employee, of course, um, in that there are benefit plans that have a standard comprehensive set of benefits. You're able to compare like to like on the price. Um, and because it's employee-sponsored insurance, obviously the employer picks up most of the tabs, so it's affordable. That, in essence, is what the idea of a health exchange is. Give people similar choices. And a big part of that is having the same or similar comprehensive benefits. You know that it's going to cover primary care, pediatric care, neonatal care, so on and so forth. Um, and so you'll have a bunch of plans in there, you'll get a subsidy if you can't afford them, and you'll have everybody from Edna to WellPoint in there. One of them should be, if the current bills as they are hold, a public health insurance option that's run similar to the way that the government administers Medicare. It's an option, no one's forced into it, no doctor is forced into it, no patient is forced into it. If you want to choose Aetna, you can choose Aetna. If you want to choose WellPoint, you choose WellPoint. If you want to choose a public option, you can choose that. Um, there are a couple of reasons why it's a good idea. Number one, private insurance does some things pretty well, and public insurance does some things pretty well. So the thought is, through the competitive process, if you have a public competitor who is doing what public insurance does well, keeping administrative costs low, not having a business model that's based on denying care or finding ways not to pay for care, but is instead focused on saving money through other methods, through more primary care, more prevention, investing in quality, more transparency. Uh, and you have a private insurance that is nimble and focused on a good customer experience and so on and so forth, that through competition, those two will enrich each other. Private insurance will start to work a little bit more like Medicare in a more, and give you more choices and hopefully bring costs down. And public insurance will you know, be there with you know, its guarantee that it's not going to be taken away from you and its business model is based on keeping you healthier. What some people don't realize is how private insurance looks at itself as a business. And there's nothing wrong with you know, running a business in this way, but the rule of the game is something called the medical loss ratio. That's really the focus of their earnings on Wall Street. It's do you take more in in premiums than you give out in care? 
That's called a medical loss when they actually pay for your health care. If you have a good ratio, your stock goes up, your investors are comforted, your CEO makes $24 million or has a luxury jet or all the other perks of capitalism. If you have a bad ratio, your stock market goes, uh, your stock price goes down, people start to panic, so on and so forth. The other thing that private insurance does is they presume most people are customers through their job. And that means you're probably only going to be a customer for five years. Why? Because people change insurance, change their jobs pretty frequently, and employers are now changing benefits pretty frequently, shopping around for good deals. Um, so if you're only going to be a customer for five years or so, they don't have a huge financial incentive to focus on prevention, on preventing you from getting diabetes 10 or 15 or 20 years from now, because you're not going to be around. They're not going to see that, that savings. Public health insurance does things differently. It says you're either a customer for life, because hopefully you'll like the experience, or we're going to get you back at Medicare, and everything that we're not paying for to prevent the illness now, we're going to have to pay for when you're in Medicare. So the idea, it's a sliver, as uh, Anthony Weiner likes to call it, it's just a sliver of a slice of the populace. The, um, the Congressional Budget Office estimates maybe six million people would be in it if it's the House version. Maybe three or two million people would be in it if it's the Senate version. But there ought to be a choice between someone that does business the way business has always been done in the for-profit private insurance and something that is similar to Medicare, that's focused on different things, that's focused on quality and prevention. And those two should go head to head. In this country, we tend to believe that if you have competition, um, both parties are better off for it, and the real winner at the end of the day is the person who's paying the bills. Um, that is the main idea behind the public option. The cons, in quick order, one, that's a government takeover of health care. Well, if the CBO says 6 million to 3 million people are in it, that is the least effective takeover of anything that I've ever seen, except maybe an island nation of 3 million people. <laughs> um, since we have 300 million people, um, the majority of whom would continue getting coverage the same way or a similar way that they do today. Um, number two is that it's too weak. Um, it does not save as much money as the original version would. The original version would have had something based on Medicare rates, would have saved $100 billion over 10 years. The new version they have through compromises would be negotiate rates the same as any health insurance company. That's not going to save money. Um, and the real reason for having it is, again, just to see, right? Have competition between public and private, give people the choice, let them decide what's good for their family, um, and hopefully, through competition, both public and private would be enhanced. That's the general idea behind it. Do you have more to say? Just a little more. The, if you think back to the history of this country, and the, the, this country was started, founded with the notion of a, a vision, and they took some really bold steps to get there. I mean, they you know, dumped tea into Boston Harbor and fought a revolution to, to, in, in light of this vision. And sometimes when you want a vision to happen, you have to be willing to take some bold steps to get there. And like you said at the end, it's about putting this out there as a public option. Let's just try it. I mean, that's enough of a bold step and not be afraid of it. And we have to remind ourselves there is a, at some level, there's a lot of public insurance already on, that exists. There's, we've been talking about it. There's Medicare, there's Medicaid, there's the, the, empl there's the plan that federal employees get, which are literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people in this country already. And there's the whole VA system that people are quite satisfied with, those people who are in that system. Um, you know, the other areas of, in terms of a public option, and one of the things, I've spoken to a number of doctors about, about the whole idea of healthcare reform and what they felt about it, and one of the, the numbers of doctors have said to me, they said, look, I like the idea of a public option. I like the idea that I'm going to get to practice medicine and not just have to worry about um, the billing and dealing with insurance companies and the amount of time I spend doing that. I, that is a, is a plus, I think. Um, the, uh, and and that's, that's a major thing. I think the larger issue, though, is that it, it's about changing the idea of a public option. It, it's a mind shift for how we think of what, Amer of what America is all about. Um, that, we, that America is based on this notion of liberty. Therefore, nobody should tell me what to do. I'm a libertarian. You know, government should stay out of my life. Um, but the fact is, is, is we have to remember the government is very involved in our lives. You know, when, when, uh, when your house starts to burn down and you call 911, you don't choose 
which fire department shows up at your house or which firefighter shows up to put out your house. You basically, you take what you get. As I say to my kids, you get what you get and you don't get upset because there's a need there. So we have to understand the government's very involved in much of our lives, sometimes for the good, sometimes not for the good. And when it's not for the good, that's the beauty of our system. We get to try to change it. Uh, there's still many more questions. Thank you, Maria. This one asks about, is there anything in either bill, House or Senate, that deals with Medicaid and, and or Medicaid spending and how much of either bill is left up to the discretion of each state? The so-called trigger or do we guess that? Well, and Medicaid is one of those regions where, uh, one of those areas of our healthcare system where unless you've been on it or known someone who's on it, you really don't know how it works. I didn't know how it worked until I started studying up on it. Um, basically, Medicaid, Medicaid is a combination of federal and state dollars. And the percentage that the federal government pays versus how much the state pays is different every state. And it is, and the federal government essentially says Medicaid is for people who are at the poverty line or below, 100% of the poverty line, and we'll, I'll use the 100% of poverty, so on and so forth. I'll probably mention it a few more times tonight. 100% of the poverty line for a family of four is $22,000, which apparently means if you're making $23,000 as a family of four, you're doing okay. Um, that's just the metric that the federal government uses to determine benefits. Medicaid does not cover in every state 100% of people who are under the poverty line. It only requires people to be covered if they are blind, elderly, disabled, or a child, and 100% under the poverty line. We don't know that necessarily in New York because New York is far more generous than most Medicaid systems. Um, we cover, in some cases, up to 100, up to 133 percent, in some cases, above the poverty line. That's money that New York pays itself to cover all of those extra people. You're not going to get that in Louisiana. Louisiana covers up to 26 percent of the poverty line for adults. I don't even want to calculate what that is. Um, and in other states like Idaho, Wyoming, nothing, unless you're blind, elderly, disabled, or a child. What the bills would do and this is something that they would move to in 2013 or 2014, is they would cover in the House bill everyone up to 150% of poverty, which is $33,000 for a family of four. And in the Senate bill, it would be 133%. So it's, I'm really bad at math, so give or take, you know, $30,000 for a family of four. Um, and who's paying for that? The federal government is. Because obviously, if you've looked around, most states are in budget crisis. They can't possibly afford to enroll that many extra people in Medicaid. But, and here's where it gets really interesting, if someone is in that bracket, um, it's actually more cost effective to put them in Medicaid, this government-run program, than it is to give them subsidies to buy private insurance. That's one of the big cost analyses that came in. So um, all adults under 133% for the Senate or 150% for the House would be covered under Medicaid by 2013 or 2014 when, if these bills pass. Originally, for the first couple of years at least, the federal government will pay for all of that. And then after a couple of years, they'll start asking the states to pay up to 9% of the cost of that. But the other thing that will happen is, as I mentioned, Medicaid reimbursement rates for primary care will go up. And that's a big part of the bills because it's very tough. Uh, if people are having trouble being satisfied with Medicare rates and you're a doctor, Medicaid rates are even lower. So that will be raised up. Uh, the other thing that will do is it will eliminate cost sharing, again, for preventative care. Um, so those are the big plans in the works for Medicaid. There are a few more things that they want to try to, to try and save money, but that's really the big, um, the big steps. And it affects a lot of people. It affects between 10 and 15 million people who all of a sudden would have coverage through Medicaid who don't apply for it just because the, every state is different in this regard. So that's a big deal. Yes. that does not pay the 50% state part 
itself. It actually cuts it in half and gives the other half to the county, which is one of the reasons why everybody says that county taxes are so high. A huge chunk of that is actually going to pay for Medicaid. Well, and actually the answer to that is, depending on which version the Senate of the House goes into the bill, will the New York get federal dollars to cover a portion of the population that's covering already. That would actually be a huge benefit to New York. Um, and that is something, by the way, if you haven't talked to your congressman yet and you're, you care about your county taxes, that is a good reason to give a call tomorrow and say, what are you doing about this to make sure that New York gets a fair share in Medicaid? It's one of the big concerns. So far, the House bill is okay on that. The Senate bill is not great and could be strengthened a lot more because part of New York's budget crisis is how much it, it pays for Medicaid every year. Um, so you're, that's a point very well taken. Oh, we have a question over there. Yes, Mara. And I'll try to paraphrase it. That's all right. Um, many of us have health insurance, thank goodness. And uh, Senator Wyden has, uh, has a, I don't know if it's going to be amended, a very simple floor, regarding people who have employer sponsored insurance actually being able to seek their own insurance through the exchange. Is that going to, what I can get, and maybe you guys know, is. Has that been analyzed to the CEO? And if so, will that, will that federal score? And he says back, or is it progress really true? It's, it's hard to paraphrase that. It's a bigger, better uh, public option or exchange or a, a possibility of a broader exchange for those of us who have private insurance. And just to, just to give a quick summary, um, if you've seen Ron Wyden on TV, you can probably sing along. Um, if you have employer-sponsored insurance right now and you get it through your job, you are currently not eligible to go into the exchange. Now the idea is that ultimately the exchange would expand. The first couple of years, uh, small businesses under 50 employees would be able to buy plans for it. But if it's solidified and if it was structured in the right way and if uh, they could take on extra customers starting in year three, year four, year five, it would be open to a larger and larger pool of businesses. It would be the business's option whether to buy plans off of the exchange for their employees or not. Ron Wyden, who's the Democratic Senator from Oregon, says, so we're building this structure and most people won't have a chance to buy their plan off the exchange. It'll be uh, at least not in the short term. So he was sponsoring something, that an amendment that would have opened the exchange up to everybody, meaning that if you are a living, breathing mammal who's not covered through Medicare or Medicaid or any of these other programs, and whether you have insurance through your employer or not, you'd be able to say, I will either take my employer's insurance or I'll fend for myself and I'll buy something off the exchange. Where that wound up, um, and he pushed for that for a long time, where that wound up is there is actually an amendment in the current version of the Senate bill that was added through Senator Wyden and uh, Senate Majority Leader Reid that opens the exchange up to a sliver of people who have employer-sponsored insurance. If your employer-sponsored insurance costs more than 9.8% of your income to you, that's obviously pretty unaffordable for a lot of folks. You would be eligible to uh, go into the exchange, but it's only if it's more than 9.8%. The CBL says that's going to be two or three million extra people in the exchange and is not going to have a dramatic effect on the cost of this one way or the other. So that's where that has wound up for now. I'm going to try to combine some of these. Uh, this one is about incentives for doctors and the big, broader picture. Uh, the, how many doctors no longer take Medicare at all? And the, the, the reimbursements are going down. We've talked about that a little bit. And then the, another question about decline in U.S. medical school admissions. And do you think that uh, national health care reform will affect the number of admissions to medical school? Or, will affect the number of people who want to become doctors. And then a further question that's added in about, um, this is from a physical therapist, about what about coverage and can and real solid coverage for, for example, physical therapists? Um, in terms of the doctor stuff, uh, by the current estimate, over 70% of doctors currently take uh, new Medicare patients. 
Um, that means about 30% have some Medicare patients but have stopped accepting new ones, um, primarily out of concern for cost and their reimbursement rates. Do you have better numbers than I do? No, I don't, but I, I, I want, uh, as a physician, I want to say that most physicians who don't take Medicare don't take anything. It's not like they take private insurance and they don't take Medicare. Yeah, they that's don't take that that's what, exactly what I was going to say. Medicare rates aren't great, at least they pay you. Right. Whereas right. The private insurance companies don't. But it has been my experience in New York City. Unfortunately I have to go to New York City. Many, many Medicare patients don't take But there are also doctors I know in New York City, having talked to several of them after my town hall, who accept Medicare but don't accept private insurance because they're sick of the delays in their compensation, particularly on the Upper East Side and the Upper West Side. So the short version is that there are, there are problems with all of these systems. It's not that one system is necessarily better than the other. But we've already talked about some of the increases, um, especially in primary care for Medicare. I will say um, there was an article by Atul Gawande in The New Yorker, uh, which came out over the summer, which um, was talking about the cost conundrum. And he was talking about a town in McAllen, Texas, um, that has the highest health care cost in Medicare per capita uh, in the country. Those are folks who are on Medicare and they're actually getting compensated at a higher rate than anywhere else. There's a lot of regional variation in Medicare. It's good in some areas, it is bad in others. Um, and, and he interviewed a number of doctors who are actually are making a killing. They tend to be specialists. Um, specialist care in Medicare, the reimbursement rates for it are pretty darn good, uh, even compared to private, private insurance. Primary care, not so. That's one of the things I have to fix. Um, but one of the other things I just want to mention is usually this comes up in the context of a public health insurance option, as we were talking about. It wouldn't use Medicare rates. There was some thoughts that it might, that it might not, so on and so forth. So uh, Robert Wood Johnson did a poll of doctors, and they said, do you prefer um, health reform that gives people a choice between public and private, that does public only, or that does private only. 62% said, I prefer something that gives the choice of public and private. 27% said, I prefer private health insurance only. Doctors are not a monolithic group. You have people on the progressive side, and you have the people on the conservative side, and you have a lot of people in the middle. Um, and payment reform is something that all countries, frankly, struggle with. Like I said, most other countries put the tools in place where they can change it in a couple of years based on how things are working. Um, but in terms of Medicare payment rates and this whole thought that everyone's going to get it, there's no provision in the bill that would force doctors to accept Medicare rates either for the public option or for anything else. And one of the things that we're really trying to fix with health care reform is primary care reimbursement in Medicare, because I don't know anyone who thinks that that's at the right level right now. Um, we have some other questions of, of different that we haven't touched on. Um, the first, this one is about tort reform in the Senate bill. Uh, it's not in the House bill, and if not, why? And what about that? The other one is about coverage for abortion uh, being paid for with, um, you know, by all of us. Uh, what is your answer to that, particularly Rabbi Groper? And then uh, what about entitlements um, that are on the brink of collapse uh, financially? Uh, what, will this become another big entitlement with terrible financial consequences for our country, implications for our country? Those are three huge. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll take the collapse of our country in tort reform if you take the abortion question. <laughs> Do it in two notes. <laughs> I, I, I'm less nervous about saying the wrong thing about the collapse of our country. Go ahead. And that's just scary, frankly, if you think about it. Um, in terms of the collapse of our country and entitlement reform and so on and so forth, um, yes, Medicare and Medicaid are a big strain on our federal budget. Uh, as I sort of said in my introductory remarks, that's why we want to fix it. Um, because as it stands right now, healthcare costs in the private industry have gone up about 9% each year, and in the public coverage programs, Medicare, Medicaid, they've gone up 8% each year. Neither one of those is sustainable in the long term. Public is slightly better, but it's still not necessarily anything to write home about. 
uh, and that's why there are so many provisions aimed at trying to wring the, the waste that the treatments that we know don't make us healthier uh, in Medicaid. One of the strongest statements is that if you're concerned about entitlement reform, if you're concerned about the deficit, you should be cheering for this all the way. Because the Congressional Budget Office has looked at both the House plan and the Senate plan, and they've said that the one thing they're guaranteed to do is bring down the deficit, and dramatically. The Senate bill would bring down the deficit by about $138 billion over 10 years. And then in the second 10 years from, from what is it, 2020 onwards, it would bring it down another $635 billion. We still have a long way to go with deficit reform, but that helps, not hurts the problem. Um, tort reform. Uh, tort reform, there is tort reform in the bill, but it's not, a, again, not anything to write home about. What it does is it incur, what's that? The House bill has, the House bill has uh, money, grants for states to experiment with other malpractice solutions. That's in the bill. They're set aside, a, I wanna say about $10 billion or thereabouts uh, as grants. Now, is that solving the problem? Yeah, can you give me your email address and I will gladly email it to you. It's in 3962, which passed. 3962, which passed. And that's the tort reform that includes. The other thing, the antitrust exemption applies to malpractice. Does that solve the problem? Absolutely not. Uh, I'm not going to pretend that it does. I'm also not going to pretend that we actually know what the answer to malpractice reform is. Because the easy answer is to put a hard cap on punitive damages. Um, most people who haven't gone through the malpractice system uh, think that that will help a lot. Um, the CBO has scored it, and the premium and the costs of malpractice um, uh, that would be solved by a cap like that if malpractice premiums dropped 30 uh, percent, it would only equal a 0.5 percent reduction in our overall health care spending. Uh, so to my mind, we haven't quite figured out what the right answer to that is because the easiest answer doesn't seem to be doing it. Um, the other thing is, and but let's be frank about it, um, this is a political problem. It is not necessarily a policy problem. Um, we've seen the Democrats um, willing to entertain very bizarre ideas and water down some of the things that they um, came in, came out of the presidential campaign saying that they wanted it to try and get Olympia Snow, one Republican senator, to sign on to the bill. Uh, malpractice reform, we know, is not a Democratic priority, it's a Republican priority. And the thing that I would submit is that if you had one, two, three Republican senators who said, you know what, I will vote for this bill, but you have to do X and you have to include something on tort reform, given the contortions that we've seen throughout the summer, It'd probably be in there. They want a bipartisan bill that badly. Um, the fact that uh, you don't have a lot of people who are willing to compromise on it and come to the table, to my mind, is the number one biggest reason why it's not in there. For Democrats, you have to compromise. And if there's no one at the table willing to give something up for tort reform, then you know they're not going to do it. They need to be coaxed into doing it. I just want to finish by saying malpractice reform doesn't work for doc uh, Malpractice in this country doesn't work for doctors, flat out. Um, no one would devise this system from scratch. It's horrible. Um, it also doesn't work for patients. And this is something that we don't dwell on enough. We know that 98,000 deaths per year are caused by medical error. That's even worse than the number of deaths that are caused through a lack of insurance. However, a lot of the people, uh, an overwhelming majority of people who have had an incident involving medical error where they or a loved one have been injured, do not go through the tort system. Um, so we're not helping the people who actually have been injured all that much. It's only a small uh, fraction of those people, and we're not helping doctors. It's a cuckoo system, and it absolutely needs to be fixed. It's probably not going to get fixed in this bill, but hopefully we can press on and find something that both sides can agree on. So abortion. Um, it, it seems like all of a sudden out of, I don't want to say out of nowhere, but all of a sudden this whole debate about health care reform in the last few weeks, it seems like almost, or last couple of months, last few weeks really, the, the issue of abortion is being raised up again. 
Um, parenthetically, I don't know if you noticed, but but if you know, as as sort of the economy began its meltdown a little over a year ago, um, a lot of the major issues that we're facing in this country in terms of social status kinds of things, uh, gay marriage, for example. Um, all of a sudden, that's like off the table. Nobody's talking about that anymore. Um, and there was a wonderful op-ed piece way back in the New York Times that kind of compared it to the time in the 1930s, that during the 20s, there was this issue called prohibition. Remember that? No, I don't remember that. I don't know how many of you do. But the issue of prohibition was this big deal, and all of a sudden, the, the bottom fell out of the stock market in 1929, and all of a sudden, nobody was talking about prohibition anymore, and they, you know, they opened up the liquor cabinets, and it was... It wasn't an issue. In other words, what drives these things is very interesting. So the issue of abortion seems to have found its way to the fore once again in, in some of these bills. Um, and and how, we, how one looks at the issue of, of abortion, I think, is really is, is, it, is not about health care reform and whether or not we reform the system, but it's a, it's a separate, it's a, it's, a, it's a piece of the issue, but it's a separate issue. What I mean by that is, um, let me, take, let me take it from a religious perspective. I would say that by and large, most religions can agree on a lot of things, can agree on a need to eradicate poverty, can agree on the idea of caring for our planet, can agree on the notions of um, seeking peace, okay? Big, big, broad issues. When you get to, down to sort of more nuts and bolts issues, um, that's where you start to find differences. And particularly between um, one of the major issues, at least in terms of, of difference between Judaism and uh, a lot of a lot of uh, Christian, a lot of areas within Christianity, particularly uh, the Christian right and the Catholic Church, is the issue of abortion, particularly on the issue and notion of when does life begin. Um, and it's really it's not a question of you know pro life and pro choice because pro life and pro choice is comparing apples and oranges. There is no there is not a single person I think in this country who is let's say pro choice who is also anti life. I mean, we have to use the, the names and the, how we use those are important. From a Jewish point of view, I'll just share with you, um, Jewish law looks at the fetus not as its own life. Uh, the Jewish Judaism does not, view, uh, does not view life as beginning at conception, but rather uh, beginning, in fact, when, a, when that baby that is born into this world takes its first breath. Uh, Maimonides, who taught, who was, a, who was also a physician, a rabbi and a physician who died a little over 800 years ago. Um, he, he went so far as to even say that if the child is threatening the life of the mother, um, even in the moment of childbirth, uh, you could cut that, he uses the phrase, and I know that's not going to sound pretty, but he said you can go and actually cut the child up limb by limb to save the mother's life. In other words, Judaism views a fetus as an appendage of a human being. So for example, let's say you had a gangrened arm medicine would teach you uh, and would implore you to cut that arm off, to amputate that arm, to save the rest of the human being. So too, if, if a fetus is attacking the mother, however one sees that, one is permitted in, Jew, in Jewish tradition to abort the fetus. Now, that doesn't mean um, abortion on demand, because that's a very different thing. Uh, and abortion should never be used as a form of birth control in terms of Jewish tradition. One would always make that decision uh, hopefully with one's physician and even discussing it with one's um, religious leader as well, just to understand that, the, the, to understand the, the implications of these things. Um, <clears throat> but, but abortion, in terms of, from a Jewish perspective, has always been viewed as, as needing to be um, safe and accessible. Uh, in Israel, which is a, a country that uses Jewish law as a lot of its basis, uh, abortion is available. Um, and it's always safe, but the interesting thing is any woman who wants to have an abortion, her case has to go before an ethics, an ethics board, um, usually made up of physicians and rabbis who review it. Uh, most of the time they actually do uh, permit the abortion to happen in Israel. I know I'm going far afield from this for a moment, but I'll come back to it. Um, because even within Jewish tradition, um, a, if the fetus is attacking, I'm going to use that phrase in quotes, attacking the mother psychologically, in other words, if having this, if bringing this child to term, have, bring this fetus to term, and having this baby uh, will affect the mother in a, in a negatively in a psychological way, abortion is usually permitted. Now we've seen over the past number of years, just as the the debate in America on abortion has has shifted uh, to the right, or at least with the conservative viewpoint seeming to take hold, we've seen some of that with these, at least within Orthodox Judaism as well, 
uh, finding its way there. Um, however, within these within these these kind of conversations, I think the question asked if it was moral and if it was constitutional. Um, constitutional, the, that's for the, that's somewhat for the Supreme Court to decide. And the Supreme Court member ruled in, in 1973, was it Roe v. Wade? Um, it said that abortion is legal in this country, and I think that by by the government uh, paying for it in terms of a, a public thing. Um, it would allow, it would not be unconstitutional. Now you, I, I don't know the details if, if what's that? What the government pay for unconstitutional? No, no, no. no. Yeah, there's yeah. something that's called the Hyde Amendment, which sets the precedent for this. That's right. Right, and abortion has continued to be a state issue, not, yes. a, not a federal issue. Um, if it's moral, you know, government doesn't really get into the issue of morality. Uh, they get into the issue of legality. Uh, it was addressed to me. So do I, think it's, do I think it is moral for government to be able to pay for abortion? Yes, I do. And in fact, I think it's more than moral. I think it's. I think it is incumbent. I think it is necessary that in a public option, if if, if somebody is going to be in the in, in having only a public option available to them, I, I personally believe that that uh, that is that is a, that's an that's a that's a necessary that's a necessary thing to have there. But I'm speaking as a rabbi from my understanding of my religious tradition. I know that if I was if a Catholic priest was sitting next to me here, he would probably have a very different answer. But of course, that's part of why we have separation of church and state. <laughs> yeah, the, the only thing uh, that I have to add to this um, very eloquent discourse on the topic is um, what is in the bill. There's something different in the House and the Senate version. The House passed a bill that essentially said that if you are buying from the exchange, whether it's the public option or the Aetna plan or the WellPoint plan or what have you, you cannot buy a health insurance plan. And you're getting a subsidy, that's the important part. If you are buying from the exchange and you're getting a subsidy from the government to help pay for part of your premium, you cannot purchase a plan that has abortion in it. Um, if you are not getting a subsidy, go nuts. Um, in the Senate bill, the Senate bill currently has something where um, it attempts to strike a balance and it says every state which has an exchange will offer one plan that covers abortion, one plan that doesn't cover abortion, and if either of these, um, and if the person who is buying the premium, excuse me, through the exchange uses a subsidy, that insurance company is required to keep the subsidy in a separate bucket, for lack of a better term, um, and the individual's premiums in a separate bucket, which means the individual's premiums can go to buy a plan, uh, can you know, be used uh, to subsidize abortions through that insurance plan. The public money is separate and can't do it. Sounds confusing, right? Uh, I borderline got confused in the middle of that. The reason for that is there is something called the Hyde Amendment, which came into being in the late 70s, that says that the federal government shall not pay for abortions through its health care programs, except in the case of rape, incest, or a danger of life to the mother. Both the, uh, I, the only thing that I'll sort of say, because I get lost in this, the only thing I'll sort of say is both of those solutions, the people who are proposing them think that they're adhering to the Hyde Amendment. It's two different ways to get at the question of whether the federal government is actually paying dollars for abortion or not. And it just sort of shows you as you get into the nuts uh, and bolts of the situation, it just gets endlessly confusing. Uh, I'm trying to kind of consolidate the questions at this point. One is about taking, again, the broader picture, mortality rates and health rates in the United States compared to other countries, morbidity, uh, mortality, all those kinds of rates. Uh, um, child um, infant mortality, all of that, and longevity rates. And then another one is about uh, what's often talked about is um, 
changing the eligibility for Medicare down and down to 60, to, to, to 55, to 50, that kind of thing. Uh, if, would that be a possibility, or is that viable, so to speak? Well, gosh, if we could have gotten that in the first place, it would have saved us a lot of grief. Um, the notion of people who are, um, is graduated steps to allow people to buy into Medicare, to pay the full premium so they're not getting paid out of the Med Medicare payroll tax, but to give that as an option to people who can't afford insurance. Um, why is, aren't we talking about that? Um, well, look how hard it is to get, you know, a relatively weakened and watered down public option, and people are still saying that it has to be pulled out of the bill. Um, some of them from the senator to, in the state uh, just over there, Senator Lieberman, saying that he's not going to vote for it unless this weakened public option, even then, is, is removed from it. Uh, it would have made a lot of sense. It is not something in general that people are considering to allow people to buy into straight old-fashioned original recipe Medicare. Um, what was the other thing? Mortality rates. Um, one of the frequently cited statistics is that we are unfortunately uh, not the best country in terms of mortality rates compared to other industrialized nations that have some form of universal health care system. That doesn't really tell you the whole story though. Um, for example, Japan has the highest uh, life expectancy in the world. Uh, I believe they also have uh, one of the highest life expectancies once you reach the age of 60. Um, so that's, you know, taking out of the equation people who die in car crashes or through violence or what have you. Um, but there's another metric which is even more disturbing, and that's something called amenable mortality, meaning people, the rate at which people die from situations that we have cures for or that there is treatment for. Um, obviously, you can't save everybody even with the miracles of modern medicine, but we would like that rate to be low. Instead, in terms of all industrialized countries in the world, we're dead last in that, too. Um, and that takes into account that we start to get into the middle of the pack on that metric that I mentioned where you're talking about average lifespan after the age of 60. We actually do much better there than we do over the lifespan as a whole. Part of the reason for that is once you hit 65, you've got Medicare, everybody's covered. Uh, or close to everybody is covered. It's near universal coverage. Um, that's one way of looking at it, and that is a quality issue, but it's also a value issue. Because I talked about Japan. Japan has the lowest infant mortality rate in the world, and they have the highest life expectancy. They don't have a single payer system. They have a system that's a hybrid, where it's part employer-sponsored insurance and it's part government program. It's not a perfect analogy to us, but it's a similar mix. They actually use healthcare more than we do. They visit the doctor more often. They have MRIs more often. Pharmaceuticals are a bigger percentage of their healthcare dollar than we are. And what they're paying compared to us is dimes on the dollar. Um, the CMS uh, with Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Studies is required to figure out what our healthcare spending per person is. Sometime over the course of 2009, and it's December, so we've probably already crossed it, um, that will cross $8,000 per person. Japan is currently spending $2,500 per person. So no matter which way you look at it, we're not getting value for the amount that we're spending. Healthcare ultimately should be about extending life, having a long, healthy, successful life. We're not doing particularly well on that score. Uh, will this, all of this be solved if the health care bills pass? No, but we have been avoiding solving the problem, which we've known has been a problem for a very long time, and we can start to improve upon quality cost and coverage. Get up. Get up. <laughs> uh, I think we've touched on some of the other the, well, the costs for uh, problems for not-for-profits, not-for-profit not small business and those expenses and the administrative costs uh, associated with um, insurance, running insurance companies. Uh, are there any other important issues that we've missed? Yes. Um, I'm not sure. What's, um, what's happening for people who are unemployed or especially students? Um, yes. What a, Well, 
What about people who are between jobs, who are young people looking for their first job? What, what does, does the new plan address that and how? It addresses it in a pretty big way because you actually just more or less describe my sister. Uh, my sister graduated from college two years ago. She currently works two jobs. Uh, she works somewhere in the vicinity of 50 hours a week. Now the job is full time, neither one of them comes with benefits. My sister's in Massachusetts, and Massachusetts, on, as part of their health care reform, allow p young people who are under the age of 26 to stay on their parents' plan until they have employment on their own. Um, and so she has health, my sister actually has pretty substantial health care problems, and she's fully covered under my dad's plan. Um, of the, uh, and I'm sure this is a handout, the top 14 provisions that take effect immediately, it's on here, number five, extends coverage for young people up to 27th birthday through parents' insurance. Is it COBRA or regular? It's regular insurance. You, so if you're 18 and you're on your parents' plan, or I forget what it is specifically in New York, but in many states it's 18. You can stay on your parents' plan up until then. Here you'd be staying on your parents' plan right on through till 27. Yeah, it just became 29. Governor Patterson signed that just recently. So New York, New Jersey, and Massachusetts all have laws like that. This would make it a national standard up to 27. Yeah. It, just, well, it's the fa it's it's the same premium that you've been paying all along. It shouldn't change. The whole point is that your premium shouldn't change and they stay on the plan. Um, but you're right, that gets into a whole separate issue is do you charge people different rates based on age? There's regulations that would actually prevent. Uh, we're actually relatively lucky in New York where we've got laws like that on the book already. Many states do not. Um, what was the other part? Oh, um, and you were talking about people between jobs. Um, and actually, the big, one of the big concerns is people who are without jobs right now. Um, and as you know, as part of the stimulus package, there were subsidies that were available for people to buy COBRA, but you can only stay on COBRA for so long. Some of those subsidies are running out. There's nothing in the plan to extend those subsidies. But again, we talk about 2013 being a very long time away. The house plan would extend COBRA benefits. COBRA is not a great system, but it's sometimes better than nothing. You would be able to stay on COBRA up until the point when the exchange was open. I know. It's not a great, it's, I'm not saying it's a great solution. It certainly is not, but it's also not nothing. Would you get a subsidy for COBRA? Well, that's if there is a second stimulus plan. Um, the stimulus money that was for people to stay on COBRA is set to expire now. And that's kind of a separate issue that the bill doesn't address. Did you want to add to that? Only, only that I started smiling when you, when you told the story of Massachusetts because there were Part of this, as Rachel said at the beginning, about organizing around something, and there's this whole movement out there called congregational-based community organizing. And it's this idea of people like this getting together and telling their stories and, and, and learning and then deciding what to organize around a certain thing. And uh, a very dear friend of mine, Rabbi Jonah Pesner, was at a synagogue in, in Boston, in the Temple Israel, which is downtown Boston and, and you know, socioeconomically quite high on the, on the on the economic spectrum, people doing quite well in that community, and they wanted to organize, and it was like, well, what are our issues that are also the same as people who live in places like, you know, Dorchester, Mattapan, you know, more sort of low-income areas? And they started talking to people, and, and the story he tells of this one man who's actually a professor at Harvard University, who was sitting there saying, you know, my daughter is going to be 20, is 25 years old, and she's an artist, and she's going to go off my plan, and I don't know how I'm going to afford her health insurance, and, and and it was hearing those common stories uh, in the, that, that were affecting people across the socioeconomic spectrum that allowed people in Massachusetts, actually churches and synagogues and, and mosques, to, to organize around this issue, this issue of health care. And this is actually what they, what they, some of the things they were able to pass in Massachusetts. Not that what they've created there is perfect, you know, and it's running into its own problems, but it allowed some change to take place. So I sort of smiled because I you know, knew at the beginning of that was. And I, I wanted to emphasize again, I don't think we've said it on mic, if you go on Frontline on Channel 13, you can get the, um, you know, the, the video version of T.R. Reid's book. Thank you for pointing that out again. It's called 
help. Well, his book is Sick Around, Sick Around the World, and it's, it's quite uh, a revelation to see what other countries are doing. What they did, and just a very short time ago in Taiwan, they researched and say, what, what's the best possible plan for us? Okay, there's a question in the back. Yes, sir. Well, now we have a good now, discussion. If, 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 I would assume that the people here, if they're here this late, all in favor of health insurance. The question is, in the 1900 days ago, in the House, 2015, where is the ticket? At what point did all of this language come into the air? At what point did we say, what you're doing doesn't work, you're against it? Where is your ticket? I, I read your book. At what point would you be against the health? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a question. <laughs> <laughs> you want to take that? Yeah. We've just we've got we've got less than five minutes. Right. And what I would say fundamentally is, um, first of all, 1,900 pages. They use big font. <laughs> um, it's really big. It's like one of those books that, that you know, my grandfather used to use because he couldn't see. Um, and it's legislative language, so it's dense. There are plenty of sources, and I think this is probably even the most important thing I may say tonight. There are plenty of sources on the web that explain this to you in, in plain, simple English. A place that I use all the time and I'd recommend you take a look at is the Kaiser Family Foundation. They're a nonpartisan um, uh, nonprofit, and all they do is healthcare. Uh, and they've got a couple of widgets, including like calculate your own subsidy under the health exchange and so on and so forth. So I, I play with their stuff all the time. Um, and they're probably the best source that I could go to. There's plenty out there. The Urban Institute has done a lot of stuff on what this stuff does and does not mean. Uh, oh yes, that's right, I'm sorry, and I should plug my own blog, which is on change.org. It's a social network site, uh, primarily for progressive issues. Um, up until recently, I was the primary writer for the healthcare page. Now we've brought some other folks in, but I'm still writing for that occasionally. Um, and I, we try and tackle stuff as it's happening, so, uh, and get as deep into the weeds as we can without losing everybody. Because um, I get lost in this stuff sometimes. The fundamental question for me is um, the fundamental question for me is it all comes down to the three big problems, which is we leave too many people behind, it costs too much, and we're the the quality of what we're getting for spending all that money is insufficient. What's meaningful progress on that? Uh, I like to say to, and this kind of ties into another question that I frequently get at these events. Can you imagine a situation in which you would be okay with a public health insurance option not being in healthcare reform? My answer to that is show me what the deal is. Um, because to a certain extent, we all have to figure out what we think our individual tipping point is. The worst bill that we saw, by far, and I bashed the heck out of this on my blog, was the Senate Finance Committee bill. Um, there were all kinds of giveaways to the insurance industry. Um, there were a couple of things that I fundamentally just didn't agree with. I wasn't crazy about the funding, although I could live with it. Um, but that bill would give coverage to 29 million people who don't have it today. That's not nothing. Um, and one of the real questions that we have to ask is, is it doing something so fundamentally destructive that it's worth telling those 29 million people you have to wait for another 10, 15 years until the next time they get health care reform done. Because there's a, I talked about a cost to failure for health care reform. There's a political cost as well. Now, past performance is no indication of future results. But generally, when we've tried this in the past and failed, usually it's, there have been a certain uh, segment of people, particularly on the left, who said, we can actually probably get something better next time. And the reality is that we actually keep getting for better or for worse, worse and worse reforms each time we try it. Harry Truman tried a national system of health insurance, didn't get it. Uh, Lyndon Johnson actually got Medicare, so good job on that. Uh, but Medicare had to improve. It was not, and many people were upset about Medicare when it w was first created because it didn't do a lot of the things that didn't have. It didn't have a prescription drug plan until the 21st century, for crying out loud. 
Um, but it gave us a starting point in which we can get better. Now, is there a way that you could jam this thing through with amendments that would be really abysmal and worth opposing? Absolutely. I haven't done it yet. Part of the reason why I do events like this and try and get people involved and try and do phone calling is to try and exert some pressure on the folks who are the decision makers in the Senate so they don't get to that point. Um, we've been told that the public option is dead more times than I can count. We were told that there was no way Senator Schumer would ever support it. Way back in when people were telling us this in January and February, he wound up being one of the biggest supporters of it. You don't know unless you're in the game. And if you're in the game, you can affect the outcome. And as messy as a legislative process is, this is something we don't get to see all the time. We get to see our government at work. And it's kind of ugly, but it kind of works at the same time, too. You're able to read the bills. You're able to go to independent sources. You're able to make up your own mind. Congress passes thousands and thousands of bills every year. This doesn't happen all the time. It's not often that we're in this situation where we actually get to pull behind the curtain, see how it works, and also take part in it. Um, that's my activist pitch. It's a bit of a cop-out answer, and I'll freely admit it. Show me the deal, and I'll let you know if, if it's the tipping point or not. It's hard to draw a line in the sand because there's just so many things that are in there, and there's you know this bill is not going to be purely good or purely bad. It's going to be somewhere in the middle. Do I think what? In the, in, the yes. uh, the, in the House bill, I think the majority of people have read it on the Democratic side because they go to town halls and get asked about it. It's probably not true on the other side because they don't get asked about it as much. The Senate bill, um, I don't know. Uh, I would like to think that they do, but I would also like to think, by the way, that not just it's legislative language. I would like to hope that if they're not a lawyer themselves, they have someone smart next to them telling them what's in the bill as well, because that counts as much for comprehension. I know all kinds of people who have given me passages from the bill and says, look, it says this, but they've never read a bill before. It doesn't say that. Um, I, I would hope that they all understand the bill more than I would hope that they have read it. I'm gonna have to be arbitrary. I, I just wanted to say again, uh, thank you to uh, Pastor Richard Allen for letting us come here. Thank you very much. Thank you for this beautiful church. Um, I have a, a from, I just got back today from Oregon uh, with my son, and this is describes the daily anguish of a physician under the present system, and it's quite powerful. I made copies if anyone's interested. Uh, just the pain and anguish of this non-working system when you see your patients suffering, so. Um, uh, but we are absolutely required, and we had promised that we would end at 9 o'clock. So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.